Hello everybody and welcome to your 47th chapter in Java E7 tutorial series. In this tutorial, we'll be talking about all the security stuff that Java EE has in store for you. So these days, security is kind of important. There's stuff that you might want to keep safe from other prying eyes and make sure that only you have access to this data that's very, uh, and that's very important. Fortunately for you, and unfortunately for those mischievous, nosy people, Java EE has a plethora of concepts and mechanisms built just for you. To make this video not last like an hour, let's split the advanced stuff security, like the advanced security stuff, for web applications and enterprise applications for another time. For chapter 48, for web applications, and chapter 49, for enterprise applications. But what we will be covering in this tutorial will be a quick overview of the Java EE security, our many security mechanisms, and making containers and Glassfish server secure, working with realms, users, groups, and roles, and finally, establishing a secure connection using SSL. So getting into it, let's take a look into our overview of Java EE security. Every enterprise has its fair share of sensitive parts. Resources that are accessed by the masses and open networks like the internet, just to name a few. As you already know from your, my previous videos, enterprise tier and web tier applications are packaged into components that make up various containers, which in turn make up the multi-tier enterprise application. These containers, thankfully, have their own securities. These can be either the declarative and programmatic securities. So the declarative security, these are features either in the deployment descriptors, just XML files, or annotations in the code itself. Think of it this way, either you set the security parameters outside of the code in a separate XML file, or you write it inside the code as you're writing it. Then there's the programmatic security, which is for when declarative security is not enough and you would like more specialized security. So let's take a look at a little bit of a walkthrough um, to better understand the role security plays in a Java EE application, let's take a look into this example. So first of all, we have our web client and our web server. So this web client is trying to access a document from the web server, which is protected by the web server. And this web client is just asking. So in this first step, um, the initial request from the web client is, uh, it's trying to request access to protected resources. Um, the web uh, server realizes that this web client is not authorized. This initiates the authentication mechanisms. So in the second step, what we'll do is uh, the web server will then return a form to the web client for validation. This form will be filled to authenticate the web client for access to protected files. Next, as a user, uh, as a user, it would be pretty dumb if a website would ask me to log in every single time I pull it up. So for user convenience, once authorization has been confirmed, uh, the user's like URL will then be added to a list of users that is authorized inside the web server. So this is URL authorization. Then step four will be fulfilling your original request. So after all the security feats, the protected web page is finally sent to our web client. Our web client does some actions and stuff and sends it back with new information. So next we got to invoke the enterprise bean business methods. So this newly changed web page, um, uh, it will be sent to the EJBs. So the EJB container does its own authorization to see if the user can actually do what they just did. And if it passes, the response is sent back to the web client, as you can see over there. So next, let's take a look at the features of a security mechanism. A properly implemented security mechanism will provide the following functionality. It will be able to prevent unauthorized access, duh, obviously it's security. And then um, it will have to hold system users accountable for the action. So users can't just do whatever the, whatever they want, they have to like be held accountable for whatever they do. They, it has to protect the system from interruptions and drops in quality of the service, and it must be easier, uh, easy to administer. Users using the system 
cannot see these system processes that is protecting them. Basically, it's like a guardian angel, like over the users and the users have no idea that the security processes are going on in the background. And it has to be easily accessible or applicable across application and enterprise boundaries, as you saw in the previous example of how you, we can put these um, security mechanisms either between the web client or in the EJB. Before we go on to the rest of the tutorial, let's take a little break and briefly skim over any big words that I might throw at you. So the first big word is authorization or access control. When you use a combination of identification and authentication to access protected data. Essentially, what identification is, is the process of identifying yourself. So basically like anything like telling us your name, uh, what your username in is, stuff like that. And authentication is the process of verifying that you are what you say. If you say that my name is Viprov, how do you know that I'm actually Viprov? I could be somebody completely different. That is where authentication comes in. Next, there is, of course, your identification and your authentication. So next is data in, uh, integrity. This is a policy that allows users to see if data has been tampered with so they can immediately discard it because you don't want data that people have already seen or people have already changed so you don't know what it is. Next is confidentiality or data privacy. This ensures that the only authorized users can access sensitive data. Next is non-repudiation. This means that users can reasonably prove they have made a transaction which also has the added benefit that users cannot deny that they've made a transaction or not. Next is the quality of service. So this is just providing the best service possible. And next is auditing. For security purposes, a record of all transactions and security information is kept. So now let's take a look into our security mechanisms. Every application's needs will be different depending on its individual needs. Java EE provides a multitude of protection layers for any specific needs that you might need. So uh, first of all, let's take a look at, um, let's go over what Java had in the standard edition. So the Java Authentication and Authorization Service, or JAS, is a set of APIs that has services that authenticate users. JAS is the foundation for all of Java EE's security mechanisms. Next, there's the Java Generic Security Services, or Java G J e JSS API. This is used to exchange messages between applications that you would like to securely communicate with each other. An example of this would be Kerbos. Next, there's the Java Cryptography Extension. This provides a framework for encryption, key generation, and key agreement as well as method authentication code or Mac algorithms. Next, let's take a look into a Java Secure Sockets extension. This is a stepping stone for the Secure Sockets layer, SSL, and Transport Layer Security, TLS protocols, and includes functionality for data encryption, server authentication, message integrity, and optional client authentication to enable secure internet communication. Next, there is simple authentication and security layer. And internet, this is an internet standard that specifies a protocol for authentication. Essentially, SASL let, tells you how the data is exchanged. And finally, Java SE has many more security tools for managing key stores, certificates, policy files, etc. Now that you have a basic understanding of Java SE security mechanisms, now we can cover what Java EE builds on. These security mechanisms are the application layer, transfer layer security, and message layer security. So the application layer security is the strongest type of security out of the two, as this type is uniquely specialized for the application it is built for. It is very easy to reach in and touch tiny bits of your code to your own will. The disadvantage of this incredible fortress is that it can hardly move. This application specific security becomes useless in another application. Next, TLS is uh, much more, uh, it's much more agile than ALS. 
This security layer is applied onto data from the time the data leaves the client until it arrives at its destination, or vice versa, even while traveling between them. This is more like a bulletproof limousine. Of course, the downside to this incredible flexibility is that it's not as tough as ALS can be. Another problem is that the data is not protected once it gets to the destination. One solution is to encrypt the message before sending it, which is exactly what the message layer security does for us. In the message layer security, information is held in a SOAP message, which allows security information to travel along with it. Any sensitive information is encrypted and sent to a receiver. In this case, only the receiver can decrypt the message. This is often called end-to-end -end security, as the message is safe between uh, between the sending and receiving of the message. So it's safe throughout the life lifetime of it. The only disadvantage of this type of security is that it's relatively complex and adds quite a lot of overhead to processing. Now in Java EE, there are two ways to secure a container. Either you can do it declaratively or the programmatic way. So the declarative way we use annotations and deployment descriptors to specify security information. Annotations are the most common way to specify security information uh, declaratively. As a Java developer, it is so satisfying to deal with a security problem right there, then and there in the code. So I don't blame you if you use annotations mostly, just like I do. Deployment descriptors have their own part to play in declarative security. They are really good if you don't want to stain your perfect code with more security gibberish. More importantly, they can be used for multiple pages of code instead of just one. This loose coupling allows deployment descriptors to be sometimes the favorite choice. Then there's programmatic security. As discussed before, programmatic security is more like a Hail Mary move. If both annotations and deployment descriptors can't suit your style, then programmatic security might just do it. We'll be getting deeper into this topic later on in this tutorial. Next, let's secure our Glassfish server. Glassfish server has its own ways of security, like adding, deleting, or modifying authorized users, configuring secure HTTP and Internet Interorb Protocol, IIOB, listeners, adding, deleting, or modifying existing or custom realms, and setting and changing policy permissions for an application and more. Now let's move on to working with realms, users, groups, and models. You often need to protect resources to ensure that only authorized users have access. This section discusses setting up users so they can be correctly identified and either given access to protected resources or denied access if they do not have authorization to access the protected resources. So what are realms, users, groups, and roles? A realm is a security policy domain defined for a web or application server. When a user signs into an application, the application may assign a role to the user, as you can see over here, depending on the, on the realm. These roles give different levels of access to different parts of the application. Users can even be assigned to groups as well, if the application wills it. Now let's take a look at how to add a Realm user. So the first thing that you want to make sure is check that your Glassfish server has started. Go into your Chrome and put in localhost 4848. In my case, Glassfish server has started, but if Glassfish server, if this page is not working for you, go into your CMD and go ahead and put in as admin start domain verbose. Go ahead and paste that over there and run that. But in my case, it's working, so let's go ahead into our Glassfish server and go down to your configurations, uh, server config, and uh, open up security and realms. And this is how you're going to add in um, your users to uh, you're going to add a realm user. Go ahead and click anything of these except for certificate. Just uh, for in, in this case, just uh, click add admin realm. Click manage users. Click new and go ahead and oh, yeah, go ahead and put in your user ID so it can be anything you want. The group list will be as admin and you can put any password 
you wish into your realm and go ahead and if you want to add it go ahead and click OK but in this case for me I don't need to add anything so let's click cancel and that's how you add a realm user and finally let's establish a secure connection using SSL so SSL or secure sockets layer is a technology which is a security that's implemented at the transport layer, which we covered before. SSL allows web browsers and web servers to communicate over a secure connection. In this secure connection, the data is encrypted before being sent and then is decrypted upon reception and before processing. Both the browser and the server encrypt all traffic before sending any data. The SSL protocol is designed to be as efficient as securely possible. However, encryption and decryption are computationally expensive processes for a pro from a performance standpoint. It is not strictly uh, necessary to run an entire web application over SSL, and it is customary for a developer to decide which pages require a secure connection and which do not. Pages that might require a secure connection include those for login, personal information, shopping cart checkouts, or credit card information transmittals. Any page within an application can be requested over a secure uh, socket by simply prefixing the address with HTTPS colon instead of HTTP colon. And that is it. That is all there is to have in store for the introduction into security in Java EE. In the next tutorial, we'll be talking about securing web applications. So until then, I will see you in the next video.